Hard questions are finally starting to be asked about what will be the real cost of net zero by 2050. President Biden infuriates his environmentalist base by asking OPEC for more oil and there are new developments on both the Covid origins question and on the fights over ivermectin. My name's Malin Baker, this is The Malin Baker Show. In the week the latest IPCC report on climate change was launched, the UK has started to brace itself for finally putting its cards on the table on its plans for net zero carbon by 2050. Now this is where things are going to get tricky because some of the grand sweeping statements of the last year seem pretty unlikely to survive the detail of real scrutiny. So, for instance, ministers are reportedly retreating now from promises to ban the installation of new gas boilers from 2035. Right now, to install the preferred solution of an electric heat pump would cost a family between eight and £12,000. A decent quality new gas boiler, on the other hand, would cost just between one to £2,000, so it's not seen as politically feasible to make that ask at the moment. Home heating, on the other hand, is responsible for 14% of our total carbon emissions, so it's impossible to hide from it for very long. One minister is reported to have said that 2035 could be framed as an ambition rather than as a hard deadline. And what they're hoping for is that as long as the market accepts that this move is imminent, then the push to scale will work its usual market magic and significantly bring prices down. But how quickly that can happen and how far it can go, those are currently open questions. In the short term, what will the government have to do to kickstart the process? There's a possibility the government will extend a scheme that offers £4,000 grants to people to trade in their gas boilers. That's still quite a long way from the comfort zone for many homeowners. Then there's the likely detail in the government's yet-to-be-released hydrogen plan. It's expected that the Prime Minister will support blue hydrogen for a number of purposes, potentially boilers, heavy goods vehicles, buses, trains, industrial processes such as cement and steel manufacture. And it's suitable for all those purposes. It's just one tiny problem. Blue hydrogen is made from natural gas, which is a fossil fuel. Research published by Cornell and Stanford universities in the US has shown that using natural gas to make hydrogen produces more emissions from methane than it would just to burn the natural gas as a fuel in its own right. I mean, it's literally worse, not better, and it's more expensive. The oil companies are keen because it could provide an early use for natural gas reserves that might otherwise become stranded assets. But, you know, why would you ever do this? And there is an answer to that question, which is to prepare the way for green hydrogen produced by electrolysis generated by renewable energy. There's a lot more production capacity right now for blue hydrogen than there is for green. Really, it's going to take a lot of time and expense to build green hydrogen infrastructure from the standing start. So being able to produce hydrogen short term at some scale would provide a funded mechanism for developing that infrastructure. And also there's capacity for blue hydrogen to be improved with carbon capture processes. So maybe that's good enough. But you can expect such a policy will get a good deal of scrutiny and will get attacked by environmentalists. But the big question right now comes down to cost. Getting the whole of the UK to the position of net zero is going to involve a significant cost, some of which will come from the private sector for sure, some of which is inevitably going to come from government. Now, one figure that's been floated is £1.4 trillion. Skeptics have said that figure seems likely to be a significant underestimate and there's a pretty good chance that they're right. In December last year, a cost analysis by National Grid estimated a £3 trillion cost and that would be just for transforming the energy network, never mind all the rest of it. It's reasonably well known that the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak, is fighting a rearguard action against the costs of net zero. And this is hardly just some old-style Tory not wanting to spend money. Over the course of a pandemic, government has been spending a shed load of money, pushing the country into a huge amount of debt. So any citizen, however much they're signed up to the goal of net zero, 
should expect that careful financial scrutiny is going to and should follow. Such citizens might also openly speculate about how come the Prime Minister's intent on buying a massive new royal yacht at the price of 250 million, which would be a fair question. At the very least, we do need to get a realistic view of what the cost of net zero is actually going to be. Whether you're cheering it on or not, it's not going to just slip through into effective and enduring action on the basis of hoping that no one's going to ask, no one's going to notice what that cost is going to be. The government's advisory body, the Committee on Climate Change, has stated that going to net zero would cost £50 billion per year between 2030 to 2050. That was the statement on which MPs agreed then Prime Minister Theresa May's adoption of a net zero target. But the Climate Change Committee has been criticised for not being transparent about how it arrived at this figure, which isn't good enough for something of this magnitude. I mean, if you want to attract negative scrutiny, it's kind of how you would behave. The Climate Skeptic Group, the Global Warming Policy Forum, submitted a freedom of information request asking the CCC for its detailed costings. They refused to give it. That refusal was taken to the Information Tribunal, which last week found in favour of the forum and ordered the CCC to produce the spreadsheets. Now look, this is genuinely a difficult thing to cost out, fair enough. A lot of the emerging technologies needed over the next coming couple of decades will see their industrial base transformed as they're pushed to scale. And that means that various costs will come tumbling down in a way that costs for solar and wind energy have collapsed. Some of them might not. And some of them will provide unforeseen dilemmas, hidden costs. But in any case, if the CCC gave those speculative numbers, Fair enough that there's plenty of uncertainty in them, but we should expect to be able to see the detail of what were the assumptions that they made in creating them. That's not an argument against action on climate change. I mean, the policy forum will no doubt press that case. The other side, on the other hand, they argue that the costs of net zero will be nothing compared to the costs of doing nothing about climate change. The costs of unmitigated climate change will be way more. Now, there's a good chance that's correct, although it's not helped by some of the advocates being rather sketchy about some of the details of those future costs. So let's see the detail. A fair assessment of both sides of the balance sheet. It's an argument to restore basic levels of accountability in government. And there's simply no way government gets to the COP26 summit later this year without having had to produce its figures. Now, in a minute, we'll get to some of the rest of the week's news, including Joe Biden's demand for more oil, not less, and a fairly extraordinary diversion by China on the Wuhan COVID story. But first, as mentioned, this week saw the launch of the latest IPCC report, a thousand pages of detail about the scientific basis of what we know and what we think we know about climate change. The mainstream media was full of colourful headlines about what it all meant, mostly alongside photos of current and recent wildfires as the perfect symbol of the drama that they wanted to convey. When you go past the headlines and look at the substance, what do we know this week that we didn't know last week? What are the themes that have been highlighted of future importance and what has been quietly downplayed? When you get past all the rhetoric of what people wish it meant, what does it really mean? That's what I'll be talking about in the deep dive video to go live on this channel Monday next week at 7pm UK time. Join me then. While the hard choices of net zero are hitting the UK government, a similar process might be said to be dogging President Biden right now. Because Joe Biden celebrated the launch of the IPCC report by calling on OPEC countries to produce more oil which might strike you as being incongruent with the messaging on fighting what they describe as the climate crisis, one of the, after all, reported central tenets of the absolutely massive spending bill that Democrats are currently working to get passed. Biden's move has come as gas prices in the US have been surging. Still remarkably cheap compared to UK prices, of course, But then most of the UK price is government tax anyway. And these things are always about the status quo that you're used to, not any sort of objective measure of what is the value of a thing. The OPEC cartel had already agreed to boost its oil supply to stabilise rising prices. 
but apparently not enough, according to the White House. Biden's National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said this, President Biden has made it clear he wants Americans to have access to affordable and reliable energy, including at the pump. Environmentalists were not so pleased, as you might predict. The Guardian led the charge with a piece headed, By pushing for more oil production, the US is killing its climate pledges. We should not mince words. If this is the stance of the Biden administration, then its decarbonisation agenda has been well and truly buried. According to no less an authority than the IEA, if we are to reach net zero by 2050, we need to end fossil fuel capacity expansion now. Of course, OPEC countries pumping oil from existing reserves more quickly doesn't involve capacity expansion, so the IEA reference isn't strictly relevant. But you know, this is the standard thing with environmentalists who think that all you do to decarbonise is just never ever do anything new that involves fossil fuels and then it will just go away. The Guardian author thinks that if prices go up, that will force affluent Americans to think maybe they should move away from gas-guzzling SUVs to electric vehicles. And then you help low-income families by spending yet more government money, because as we know that grows on trees, to provide targeted relief. But of course, if you give the middle class a huge shove right now towards electric vehicles, you're going to quickly discover that the market is nowhere near yet being able to meet that demand. And it's just possible government can't just throw money at supporting every single low income family to pay for their gas, particularly since the existing huge spending bill may not even pass. But even if it does, the government only gets a chance to do one of those per year, the budget reconciliation bills. Environmentalists have no sense of process in all of this. Their aversion to fossil fuels is a moral one. There's just no pragmatism in there. If you want to make a big shift in how the country's powered, particularly in America, with its deeply polarised polity, you need to do what you can to take people with you. And that's not to say that Biden has a well-designed programme that's designed to do that. Arguably, massive spending bills of the sort that Democrats are trying to pass is an approach with an extremely poor track record of success. That's a whole other question for another video, perhaps. In other news, over recent months, we've occasionally been checking in on the heated debate over whether the drug Ivermectin is or isn't an effective treatment for COVID-19, with most of the recent evidence pushing towards a no. Two things have changed that push into the realm of a shove. First is the headline result of one of the large-scale studies that had been ongoing that has now been reported. The TOGETHER trial is a major study covering 1,500 participants supervised by Canadian McMaster University and carried out in Brazil. It began the study with ivermectin and then changed its method by request of ivermectin advocates who argued that the initial intentions were not in line with their recommendations. So they followed their new recommendations, which involved a daily dose of 400 micrograms of ivermectin per kilogram of the patient's weight for three days. They've now reported the headline outcome. In our specific trial, we do not see the treatment benefit that a lot of the advocates believe should have been. And for the avoidance of ambiguity, they said that ivermectin had showed no effect whatsoever on the trial's outcome goals. The full study hasn't yet been peer-reviewed and published, so the details will follow, no doubt will be heavily scrutinised. In the meantime, I'm not a fan of this write-up in the LA Times. It seems to aim to give the impression that Trump's people were wrong again, which is the kind of framing that arguably meant we had to wait for as long as we have for proper full-size clinical trials to even take place. Now, the study did actually look at fluvoxamine, another low-cost repurposed drug, and found that that one had some degree of promise. And you'd think that would have been worthy of mention in this article. So that was the first thing. And then the second... Apparently, one of the prime movers in the ivermectin movement, Pierre Corey, who has been following and advocating for the regular use of ivermectin as a prophylactic, which means you take it regularly and then you won't catch COVID. And remember how much certainty was in the original promise here. For instance, in Corey's testimony to the US Senate, which was disgracefully taken down by YouTube, by the way, he said this. 
Mountains of data have emerged from many centres and countries around the world showing the miraculous effectiveness of ivermectin. It basically obliterates transmission of this virus. If you take it, you will not get sick. And he has been taking it. And well, it turns out that he and his family recently caught Covid. He made this announcement on a weekly Zoom call with his organization, the FLCCC. I actually broke through and got COVID last week. My daughter got it uh, and I got it a couple of days later. I was probably day seven from my last ivermectin dose. I take it weekly. It probably also prompted this tweet that he made recently. I have experienced and am getting reports from FLCCC Alliance members that Delta variant patients crashing into ICUs are not showing responses to MAF+, which is their recommended treatment mix. We are demoralised and frightened. Early treatment is critical. Every household should take iMask+, upon first symptoms. Or get vaccinated is another popular choice that people can do. Given the growing weight of evidence to suggest that at the very least that degree of certainty is not warranted, it was only a matter of time before something like this happened. Now, I trust that he and his family have recovered or are recovering. Nobody needs for anything to go worse in order to make any kind of point in this argument. Equally, nobody should be surprised at the face-saving formula which was that this was all working fine until the Delta variant came along. Not that this was wrong from the beginning, it was working splendidly until the Delta variant. If that formula enables a climb down, then fine. But unfortunately, his first response was to suggest that his supporters should just double the rate at which they're taking ivermectin. I would point out that the advocates have spent the last few months pointing out what they claim to be miraculous figures, miraculous, in how ivermectin led to cases and deaths in India to plummet. Well, you know, the Delta variant was originally known, of course, as the India variant. It was dominant in that second wave which swept through the country. Indeed, Corey was repeating the claim just a few days ago. I've already explained why those Indian graphs were examples of cherry picking, but fine. But, you know, you can't have it both ways. Either it is wholly effective against the India variant, and that's why those figures in India happened, or the Delta variant is a game changer, and now something that used to work is no longer working. It could be neither of those. It can't be both. I do think that while we await the full results back from the larger studies, everyone that's been advocating for this drug just needs to take a step back from certainty maybe re-evaluate their options. I make no recommendations here. Do not take medical advice from YouTubers. Every adult has a free choice to do what they choose to do. Just try to do it with a realistic view that what you've been told about relative risks may not be entirely correct. Now, in a moment, we'll look at the extraordinary claims that China has been making on the origin of COVID-19 and a final thought for the day. But first, Professor Ken Rice is a professor in computational astrophysics. He's also behind a long-running and high-profile blog on climate change and related issues, and then there's physics. He's an engaged commentator on the arguments and debates over climate change and also on climate science communication. He and I had a fascinating and wide-ranging conversation where we talked about the current state of the debate, the grey areas between scientists and campaigners, and the changing role of science in the big issues of the last couple of years. You can see the full discussion with Ken Rice in a video going live on this channel on Wednesday next week at 7pm UK time. Join me for that. It was pretty obvious when the WHO mission to China reported earlier this year that it had been a pretty big misfire. They spent little time looking at the possibility of a lab leak, but they nevertheless reported back that such a leak was highly unlikely. Now, that has been outlined by the head of the expedition, Dr Peter M. Barrack. In a documentary on Danish TV this week, M. Barrack said that it was now a likely hypothesis that a lab employee could have picked up the virus. He said that WHO investigators were forced to conclude that a lab leak was extremely unlikely in the official report to avoid further arguments with the Chinese. Because, of course, that's the priority, not discovering the truth or something like that. Reportedly, the team came to an impasse with China, which would only allow mention of a lab leak if there were no recommendations for any further investigation. So that, of course, is exactly what they did. 
and the incongruity of the statement that stood out like such a sore thumb should hopefully have been a lesson to the Chinese about the contradictory impact of trying to suppress discussion. Dr. M. Barak also noticed that a second lab, the Wuhan Centre for Disease Control and Prevention, had moved its premises to just a third of a mile from the Wuhan wet market where the outbreak first appeared. And it moved on the 2nd of December 2019, pretty much around the time when it all kicked off. M. Barak said this, We know that when you move a lab... It disturbs all the procedures. You have to move the virus collection and the samples. That's why that period of time and that lab are interesting. Interesting indeed. In the meantime, the Chinese authorities have moved from the concerned to the desperate, by all appearances. Chinese media has been full in recent days of commentary by a Swiss biologist, Wilson Edwards. Edwards has been quoted saying things like, As a biologist, I've witnessed in consternation over the past months how the origin tracing of COVID-19 was politicised. He remarked how worried he was about the WHO's independence, saying that the US is so obsessed with attacking China on the origin tracing issue that it is reluctant to open its eyes to the data and the findings. Now, you might think that sounds like an odd turn of phrase for a Swiss biologist. And lo and behold, it turns out that Mr Wilson Edwards actually seems not to exist. The only evidence of his existence was a Facebook profile which was opened just two weeks previous to his first public statements and where on which he had only three friends. The Swiss embassy said that there's no registry of a Swiss citizen with the name Wilson Edwards, there are no academic articles under that name and they called on the misinformation to be removed. And indeed, articles mentioning this China-friendly expert have been being quietly amended after the event with all of those references taken out. But of course, we absolutely accept the Chinese government is wholly trustworthy when it says that there was no lab leak in Wuhan. Obviously. There's a lecture by Viktor Frankl where he talks about how, at an advanced age as he was, he had started taking flying lessons. And his instructor had taught him that if you had a strong crosswind from the north, say, and you were flying from A to B, you would need to direct your plane slightly northwards of your actual target because the wind would push you off course. And that way you would then arrive at your actual target. If instead you simply flew in the direction of your target, you would end up somewhat south of where you wanted to be. He was talking about how you define purpose in your life, and he said that you should take the same approach to living your best life and being the sort of person that you want to be. If you simply aim to be the person who you thought you could be, life's crosswinds would blow you off course to be somewhat less than that. But if you aim for higher, if you aim for the person you wish you could be, your best self as you can imagine it, then you would arrive at being the person you can be. We have found new ways to create crosswinds to blow us off course. Social media discourse has particularly emerged as a powerful force to push people down to a lowest common denominator. Dismissive, aggressive, virtue signalling, tribal, likes and retweets reward flying south and only the shallow pretense occasionally of flying north. And that's before you even get to the sort of misinformation that could blow you off course while you're still thinking that you're doing the right and moral thing. What does it mean? to tack into the crosswinds of our modern digital life, to think that we can aim to be the best version of ourselves and to try to make it happen. Well, you know, Frankel had survived the Nazi concentration camps. His life experience had brutally stripped away everything except for that essential core. And that's what makes him such a powerful speaker. Such suffering makes you a serious person. Well, we have not so suffered, and social media conspires to make us not serious people. Maybe we should try an experiment. For one week, when you reply to someone in YouTube comments or Twitter or wherever, imagine how you would have that conversation if you and the other person were both inmates in the Buchenwald concentration camp. How much would you see that you had in common with that other person, how important would be the issue that you're currently arguing about? Now, OK, you can't hold that sort of thing in your head forever. We're only human. But try it for a week. 
See if it changes the purpose of the conversations you have and the version of you that you aspire to be. And if it doesn't work, then next week you can come back and tell me what an idiot I am. Obviously. All right. Thanks to those of you that joined me for this week's live stream and for staying with it through the technical glitches that it started with and then the less than fantastic audio quality throughout. I contemplated taking it down because, I mean, I'm not a perfectionist, but I hate putting up something that I feel isn't at a suitable standard. But there were some great questions and many of the people who asked those questions probably weren't able to join live. So for now, at least there it is. A frustrating thing of working with tech platforms is that you can leave things alone from one month to the next and then find that what worked fine last month doesn't work this month. As far as I can tell, there was some background software update and that made some difference somewhere in the chain. I decided the easiest way might be to just update my MacBook to the current version of the operating system, Mac OS X. And from a quick test after the update, that does seem to have resolved the problem. So my learning from this is that regardless of whether I changed anything, I need to run a full test of the tech a few hours before any scheduled live stream. Fair enough, yet another lesson learned. I didn't think we discussed anything dangerous in that live stream, but YouTube demonetized it anyway as soon as it finished live streaming. It was restored after appeal, but of course that only happens after it's already had most of its views. So thanks again, as always, to the people who support this channel on Patreon. Thanks to your support, I can keep working on videos for this channel, improving the quality of what I do, hopefully, getting ideas, information and arguments to a wider audience. I can focus on the topics that matter, regardless of what YouTube thinks about whether they should be monetized or not. If you would like to add your support for the independent, fact-focused and non-ideological content that I aim to produce here, please go to patreon.com forward slash Baker. It is always appreciated. Either way, have a great week. My name is Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please share with anyone else you think would also enjoy it. Word of mouth is really important to us. And if you've not subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? As the saying goes, that subscribe button won't smash itself. 